In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Day of wrath and doom impending, David's word with Sibyl's blending, heaven and earth and ashes ending. O oh, what fear man's bosom rendereth, when from heaven the judge descendant, death, on whose sentence all dependeth. Wondrous sound the trumpet flingeth, through earth's sepulchres it ringeth, all before the throne it bringeth. Death is struck, and nature quaking, all creation is awaking, to its judge an answer making. Lo, the book exactly worded, wherein all hath been recorded, then shall judgment be awarded. When the judge his seat attendeth, and each hidden deed arrangeth, nothing unavenged remaineth. What shall I, frail man, be pleading, who for me be interceding, when the just are mercy needing? King and majesty tremendous, who dost free salvation send us, send us, font of pity, then befriend us. Think, kind Jesus, my salvation, cause thy wondrous incarnation, leave me not to retrobation. Faint and weary, thou hast sought me, on the cross of suffering brought me, shall such grace be vainly brought me? Righteous judge for sin's pollution, grant thy gift of absolution, ere that day of retrobation. Guilty now I pour my moaning, all my shame with anguish owing. Spare, O God, thy supplicant groaning. Through the sinful woman shriven, through the dying thief forgiven, thou to me a hope hast given. Worthless are my prayers and sighing, yet, good Lord, in grace complying, rescue me from fires and dying. With thy sheep a place provide me, from the goats afar divide me. To, the, to thy right hand do thou guide me. When the wicked are confounded, doomed to flames of woe unbounded, call me with thy saints surrounded. Lo, I kneel with heart submission, see like ashes my contrition. Help me in my last condition. Ah, that day of tears and mourning, from the dust of earth returning, man for judgment must prepare him. Spare, O God, in mercy spare him. Lord, all pitying, Jesus blessed, grant Grant them thine eternal rest. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Uh, welcome to uh, Monarchist Minute, uh, Royalist News and Discussion out of the good old U.S. of A. Um, we're here uh, tonight to discuss several topics, um, but uh, chief among them, and I guess technically this, I should, Vic should have been introducing this, but we didn't have time to think about that beforehand. Um, we're going to be talking about the death of Pope Benedict uh, and his life and legacy first. And then we have uh, several other topics to get to. And since I forgot to, didn't think to mention this beforehand, I'll let Vic lead us off because he really should have been doing the intro after the DSE array. As I stated on Saturday morning, on our YouTube video that was released. Pope Benedict XVI, born Joseph Ratzinger, died on New Year's Eve at, not at around 9.30 a.m. Rome time. And if you want to know more about his life and legacy, we have a YouTube video up that will tell you about that. Um, who just left? So, um, Pope Benedict, for a lot of us, he was probably the first pope that, uh, most of us were conscious for. I mean, I was two when Pope St. John Paul II died. Um, although I only really knew who Pope Benedict was when he did the regenation. Regi Me fail English. Um, the, his resignation uh, from the role. Um, yeah, I remember watching that live stream uh, on uh, in school, Catholic school, obviously. Although, <laughs> see how far the internet's come in that time. We were all lagging behind uh, because I think every every classroom was trying to watch it at once, <laughs> and and the power oh. of of five of like. 10 different classrooms all trying to watch the same thing at the same time. Ooh, wow, that, that's too you much. Ask the question, how does one resign from being Pope? Because you're supposed to serve that for life. You just, you do. I mean, you're still, you're still Pope. You're just no longer serving at the office of the Pontifex. I mean, I'm not sure of the understanding myself, but I mean, it's, I mean, Traditionally, yes, and I guess this is a tradition started by St. Peter that, you know, you are the Pope until you die, because 
uh, St. Peter was crucified upside down. Um, and most of the first popes after that uh, didn't necessarily have a peaceful deathbed death. They had a uh, Roman pagans are getting upset kind of death. Um, so, I, but I mean, it's there's no nowhere in the rules has it ever been that the Pope has to be Pope until his death. I mean, if he... I mean, some it's just kind of tradition. Provide some context that I actually didn't provide in the YouTube video. Pope Benedict XVI was the first Pope to resign in like 500 or 600 years. Yeah. But that doesn't really answer his question of, I mean, how does a Pope resign, which I can't really say for sure how. I mean, I just know that a Pope, he can't, any individual Pope, he can do it. I mean... Again, because the Pope, it's been so long since the papal resignation, we don't know how a Pope resigns. All we can do is look at what Pope Benedict XVI did and say, I guess that's how he's supposed to do it. Well, I, I think I think actually they, they did draw on the previous popes who, who resigned for how it was done. Because I do remember the news lady, whatever, was, was saying, like, he's going through these doors or whatever. Um, I think it was guess, more of a symbolic. Th I think it was more of a symbolic thing than anything else that he did. Well, that. I, I think that I, I there's thought no I set rule. Well, yeah. How no, can there I, be? A, how can there be a set rule when you go six hundred years before the next one? Well, I mean that's that's just it. There are rules that are used very infrequently, like uh, rules for how to beat the beat the members of the House of Representatives for not being able to pick someone. But that's another topic. Um, that part of the con anyways but no i mean i mean the resignation aside i mean pope benedict was um i mean in hindsight you know as someone who was seven eight at the time of his resignation he was he was a a great uh a great pope from from what uh little i know i mean my copy of the denzinger only goes goes to the end of the pontificate of um of uh Pope Benedict. So I guess when Pope Francis dies, then we're gonna get uh, we're gonna get Denziger edition for Um, but but yeah, no. I mean the the Sumi. Um, what was it? Uh, what was his his uh, decree on the Latin Mass that was supposed to end the liturgy wars? Sumor um, pontificum. Sumor pontificum. Um, Sumor. Okay. Sumorum. Sumorum pontificum. pontificum. Yes. I did take two years of Latin and failed the pronunciation every time, you know. Um, and that was classical Latin, too, not even ecclesiastical. Um, but anyways, um, yeah, so the... Um, boy, we're not really doing, doing a great job. I'm sure our engagement's going to be really great this part. If you made it <laughs> to this part, put something in the comments. It boosts engagement. Um no, but but you know his his understanding, you know, for the Latin Mass and why that was a good idea. That um, yeah, that was that was good, and I don't want to say anything negative about Pope Francis because um, really, I don't know. I mean, I think that if Pope Francis were to die today, I'd hope we remember him for him insisting that we all say the St. Michael prayer after Mass. I, I, I think that that'd be what uh, what I would like everyone to remember him for. Um, but yeah, I mean, Pope Benedict, uh, he was very orthodox, and I say that with the lowercase o, obviously, <laughs> in his um, in, in his in, in what he wa and you know and what he taught and um, if you and I guess Charles Colomb who was more conscious in that time than I was once again being eight um, you know he was he was the guy who said uh, if Pope Saint John Paul II was the guy who said okay let's stop breaking things Pope Benedict was the guy who said okay let's start to fix things um, and I guess Pope St. John Paul II also started to fix things because apparently he had an indult for the Latin Mass, uh, which was a more limited 
developed thing than what Pope Benedict would later do. But um, yeah, so I think that from a man who who tried to revitalize the church's in the Western right, the church's lowercase t traditions. I think that that is he's going to be very beloved, uh, especially by the younger Catholic audience, the audience Catholic faithful who are uh, particularly traditional. Um, and uh, I oh. hope soon. Oh, now I'm curious if the other, if the former two popes try to. Yeah. Restore the Latin Mass and um, basically kind of undo some of the trends that have happened in the Catholic Church over the past several decades. What's going on with the current Pope and his issue with the Latin Mass? Well, Pope Francis. I mean, okay. So Pope Francis. A lot of the a lot of the clergy his age, a lot of the cardinals or whatnot, were the young priest. When the when the changes that resulted after Vatican II, because Vatican because Vatican II never called, at least from my reading of it, never called for smashing up altar rails and uh, and and mass in the vernacular. Um, but I haven't read all the documents, so maybe it's in there somewhere, and I just haven't seen it. But um, I I'm pretty sure it isn't. But but so well, Pope Francis was part of that alert, generation. It's not Spoiler alert, it's not there. Yeah, well, P Pope Francis Pope Francis was part of that original generation of priests who, who wanted to, and, and I think that he's of that school, and it was the school of thought that we need to adapt for modern, essentially they're looking at the easy solution, which... The, that school thought. You need to, oh, yeah, you, you need to open the windows up and let the new springtime flow through. Yeah. Vatican II was seen by its supporters as a kind of new Pentecost, as it were. Yeah, and, and you know, I'm, I'm not trying to cast shade on Vatican II, because Vatican II, there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of what I have read from Vatican II, I mean, I mean you know, a lot what, what I have read from Vatican II is very orthodox. Um, and I think it was St. Pope John Paul II who said you had to interpret Vatican II in the context of the previous um, councils, which you do. Um, but the, the, the thing is, is that, is that um, Vatican II, I mean, Pope Francis' generation um, a priest was was essentially taught that we have to say I, I don't want to say dumb down, but that's essentially what happened because That is exactly that is exact that is exactly what their thought process was. Yeah, because I mean the because here's the thing. So Catholicism has always had an intellectual element to it. I mean you read you read the Bible Right. And and, you know, it's not it, the St. Paul's letters and none of the letters are simple. They're 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 full. You know, they're by nature, I guess they're philosophical in somewhat uh, in addition to being instruction. Right. They're not it's there's always there's always the but what does this mean, though? Like the first few philosophical concepts, I mean, like the Council of Nicaea was arguing over whether or not we would use whether or not the sun was consubstantial of the same substance or of like substance. Spoiler alert, he's of the same substance as the father. The um, argument was homoousian versus homoousian, I believe was the exact terminology. Uh, okay, yeah, I'm not really, I, I'm not really a Greek, Greek uh, I don't, unfortunately, one of the things I don't know is Greek. Uh, but yeah, so, and and that and that's important, you know. And and people, I don't want to say they don't that that generation didn't think it didn't matter, but nobody. But the the people, I mean, it, it's just the simplifying of the religion, like the like you know, having pizza parties or whatever, to tr and and the priest coming in with a guitar trying to get everyone involved in youth groups rather than actual proper um, Bible study or whatnot. And um, 
it's it's that sort of thing. And I don't think Pope Francis is being malicious. I don't want to say that at all. I, I think that his generation sincerely believes that this is what what will bring people back into the fold. But I look at what, you know, the the Latin mass in my area, and I think in most people's areas, but I can only speak for my area specifically, the Latin mass in my area has a lot of young people going to it. And the same priest who does the Latin mass also does the Norris Ordo, and he does it very reverently, like, you know, the sun gospel and all that, and using the altar rail. And that's where the young people are. But then I look at the parish that I go to because I go to mass with my parents, and uh, even though all if if I could say, hey, if I had the choice, I I think we go to the you know more traditional masses. But um, and I know I'm rambling on, and we should probably start moving so it's not just let Warren let Charles talk you for half it, an hour. You did it. You did it. You I know did I did yourself. it, but I have, I'm not going to remove it. You know why? Because I don't have a problem with people knowing who I am. My name is already out on the internet anyways. So whatever. Um, still cut it out for continuity. Nah, I'm good. But anyways, um, no. So I'm going to, I guess I'm going to wrap this up because I don't really have the wherewithal to, to do this and i want this video to have somewhat decent engagement um i think that pope francis generation i don't think they're being malicious i think that they legitimately see they think what they're doing is the best thing to do but i think that they're wrong <laughs> in that in that because I am interested, I want to, I want the, the, the old prayers and the old way of doing things and everything about that that built off those, those 2,000 years of, 2,000 years of studying, you know, you know, because remember, divine revelation was finished with the death of St. John, the last apostle. Um, and studying that, you know, the, the 2,000 years of studying that and, and building up prayers around that and everything that flowed organically from that. The the Latin Mass, you know, feels more like the Mass of my fathers. Um, and maybe this is just because I know it intellectually. But it feels more like the Mass of my fathers than the Norvus Ordo does. And I went to the Norvis Order my entire life. And I'm not saying the Norvis Order is invalid, because if the Norvis Order is invalid, then oh boy, am I in trouble. But, um, you know, I'm just, I'm just saying that as an expression of the Western Rite, personally, I, I, I feel that the Trinitine Mass is the better expression of the Western Rite. Uh, but the Pope has his reasons, and I'm not going to um, say, I'm not going to walk up to the Pope and say you're wrong like that. I mean, if he asked my opinion, I'd give it to him, but I mean, why would he ask my opinion? I'm just some random Yankee from Michigan. <laughs> I mean, I, I, <laughs> typically speaking, we don't have that many great theologians. Michigan. Ew. I mean... If if anyone in the audience could come up with Michigander theologians, that'd be wonderful. Right. Um, so I just wanted to um, <clears throat> give a brief personal note about Pope Benedict. Uh, Pope Benedict, in a lot of ways, I remember. At the Requiem Mass my parish held last night for him, I watched it on YouTube. I remember Father getting up onto the pulpit after the Mass to give his little eulogy. And Father said something um, that it sort of felt like his resignation confused people. Maybe they thought he was close to death. As it turns out, he wasn't. And his resignation, like there are some Catholic commentators, not my priest, but there are some Catholic commentators out there that have said that Pope Benedict abandoned his people twice. Um, I 
don't see the argument for twice. I see an argument for once because, as it turned out, he was very clearly mentally competent in his final days. When, when Tadeus Custodis was released, it is said that Pope Benedict had a broken heart. And it is said, and the, the priest, the, slow down, the priestly fraternity of St. Peter revealed that Pope Benedict XVI sent them a private letter of encouragement after the release of Traditionis Custodis, which leads me to believe that His Holiness was in fact mentally competent to the last. Which, le which I think puts his, put his, puts his reason for resignation a bit more under the microscope and we just don't know why he, we just will never know why he did it. And we can pray that Benedict made the right choice. We can pray that he made the right choice in his heart. And we can pray for his soul like we did at the top of the show. And I think that's the last word that I think we can say about Papa Bene's legacy. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, Pope Benedict, um, I think that Pope Benedict, um, I, 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 according, I think again, according to Charles Cologne, that, that when he was, um, when he became Pope, he, he said that, you know, something like pray for me that, that I do not become afraid of the wolves. Or something, and uh, when yes, he right. he resigned, he said, "You know, Pope. I mean, Pope Charles. <laughs> oh boy, um, oh boy. How, how would that go?" Um, Charles Colm said, "Well, I guess we didn't pray hard enough." Um, and that I don't know. I mean, ultimately, ultimately, I think that goodwill come out of this, you know, because God can work good out of any situation. And I don't know. I mean, I I hope that I don't know why he did it, and I'm not I'm not him, so I can't say, but all I can say, I guess, is my way of wrapping up and letting someone else speak or us moving on would be that I hope soon we go from praying for the repose of his soul to asking for his intercession. Um, because I I don't have anything against the man. Um, yeah. I guess that's... With yeah. that, I think we've uh, exhausted this topic. God bless his soul. And uh, I say we move on to our next uh, topic. Anyone disagree? No. No, my stunt double. No one disagrees. What is our next topic? I believe our next topic is uh, how both woke culture and the opposition to it are inherently products of American cultural imperialism and people importing the American political paradigm. Mm. So well, firstly... Do we want to define what that it what that means? Yeah, yeah that that that's a will question because I just want an intellectual thing. I had this thought just this morning. You know, I think it's Einstein that said doing something monotonous helps free up the mind to um think about critical things. And I was just running my morning errands, and I came up with this idea. And I thought about it, and I realized that. I thought about woke culture in Europe and how it's spreading in European countries, and I thought and I realized that both woke culture and the opposition, the popular opposition to woke culture, both look at the issue from a very American idea and very American position and revolving around it in ways that often don't make sense in the context of the European culture, in the European cultures that they are now inhabiting, and it doesn't make sense with them historically. For example, let's take Sweden, for example.
Sweden has, well, everyone said Sweden's become very, very woke over the years. But the issues that Sweden outlines with their wokeness, primarily in regards to their immigration policy, is that Sweden has never had a, a history of large immigration. They've never had a history of institutional racism because they've never really had institutional minorities to discriminate against. Sami. And so there's no real cultural reason for them to have woke culture other than the fact that they're importing it primarily from American political influence and understanding. And likewise, the counterculture to woke culture, primarily revolving around European identalism, is not really a thing historically in Europe because Europeans don't typically historically define themselves as one whole group but instead reflects on an American idea typically associated with those against conser against immigration that is usually defined as things that are American and things that aren't American. We see as defined as things that are European and things that aren't European. But the idea of Europe being one whole group has historically never existed. Mm. If I explained that well, I don't know if I did. I, yeah, I see what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think that um, a lot of, especially like that kind of thing in Europe, and it's been happening in like Germany, the UK, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, all those Western European countries, it's become more common to take an American stance on things, despite the fact that those things don't, like you said, don't really exist in Europe. I think the it, best way we've seen this in Europe is how the equation of Nazism and white supremacy, how that equation that those two things are related has crept into Europe, when historically Nazism was about German supremacy and didn't necessarily subscribe, oh, white races is equal. It wasn't until that white supremacists in the U.S. then appropriated Nazi... Um, symbolism and some Nazi ideology into their own circles that the notion that Nazism is inherently white supremacist came about. Yeah, that yeah. sounds about right for the uh, modern situation, yeah. I don't think that uh, Europe really would have progressed in that way if it hadn't been for America and, and well, circling back to Nazis. America wouldn't exactly be the dominant cultural power if it wasn't for World War II. Yeah. yeah. I I mean, I would I would say that um a lot of the intellectual movements that resulted in wokery did come from European intellectuals. Now, I could go on about how this is all Martin Luther's fault. But for once <laughs> In the interest, in the interest of saving time, in the interest of saving time, I will just say that this is ultimately all Martin Luther's fault. Martin Luther's fault, but, yeah. but, <laughs> but, but, so, but, but, but more specifically, uh, all of these communist intellectuals who, um, uh, who came out of Europe post World War II and who like fled to the United States. So as a whole, Europe brought this upon themselves. Brought this upon herself. Yeah. So yeah. And well, circle. the whole the whole woke culture of like trying to be the most you know um, politically correct, right? Trying to be the uh, the bestest of all people, right? Like that whole thing came from countries in Europe copying, like you said, American kind of ideals and trying to be more, you know, as we'd say now, woke. So that whole idea started with the Europeans taking that, that kind of American ideal of progressivism and pushing it to an extreme. But, yeah, so okay. now I will say there are some countries that did have institutional racism, especially in the issues of their colonies, such as France <laughs> or Britain in some cases. 
where some of the things I get associated with folk culture might have historical context, in the vast majority of European countries, it does not. Especially mm. in Eastern European countries, and I think that's why we see the greatest resistance of woke culture, culture in Eastern European countries, like Poland. But at the same time, Poland and other countries, and especially amongst conservatives in Western Europe, started adopting that American counter woke culture and perspective. And now we're starting to see a problem where countries are becoming more and more like the US in a social political climate. Um, yeah, it, it kind of did just lead to the spread of the two dominant American ideologies being uh, liberal progressivism and uh, right-wing populism as kind of big ones in Europe as well. Right, and I think I would this argue, is the I would argue um, the second one is conservative progressivism, i.e. Teddy Roosevelt. Yes. Mm. Okay, so I have to object to sort of the oversimplification calling it American, because um, it has very uh, objective European influences. Um, sort of the the modern form of it certainly was formulated in America, but the the source of it goes back to the Frankfurt School, which, as the name implies, uh, was from Germany, and. Was I mean, a a way, the Frankfurt part School of the general Marxist to do with effectively European. The Frankfurt School has nothing to do with modern world culture. The main goal of the Frankfurt School was to try and figure <laughs> out why country industrialized nations such as those found in the West never did have a socialist revolution as we've seen in yeah, other I'm, countries. I'm aware. And the main reason I'm they aware. found was that because of had to do more with consumerism than it had to do with cultural reasons. There's well, there's a there's a definite through line from there to critical theory. And it was a split between the critical theorists and the critical race theorists in America that um is what led to the mo what we would consider the modern woke. Yeah, I I, I for once I'm agreeing with Koshin. Guys. What is nearly this? 70 episodes in. Koshin and I can finally shake hand oh wait, we're not in the same room. Never mind. Um <laughs> So so like, there the, we go. The the American thing about it was the very American racialization of it. Like that's completely true. The um your Europe is sort of importing through it this dumb, completely ahistoric, racialized view of itself. But um, it, it, the entire thing very much has roots that lead back into Europe. It's not like this thing came whole cloth out of them. True. Mm -hmm. I mean... I Ultimately, given that America is very much a European country anyways, at any rate, it would be kind of Europe's fault, and one specific We're guy British. in particular. Oh yeah, the British too. The British like to pretend that they're different, but as we all know... Well, they are. Yeah. Anglos, you, you guys are much like that one German guy. You know, I mean, uh, what was his the name? Master has become and, the, the servant. The servant there's a reason why. The <laughs> there's a reason why I feel, uh, in, in terms of like um, tracking the evolutions of various philosophical schools, there are two schools which are named British School and the Continental School. Though those both are products, I'd say, of the Enlightenment. Ugh, the Enlightenment, am I right? Ew. Gross. Ew. Fringe people thinking. I have to agree with the idea of the British school and the Continental school, and the main difference between the British school and the Continental school has to do with um, how they affect 
how the market relates to them. Continental school tended to be more collective, is why the British school tend to be more market libertarian in nature, free market and all that. As we saw with yes, the Scottish but, Enlightenment, whereas... I mean, the thing is, the British have had a um, very long history of being more liberty-minded. You know, you go back to the Magna Carta, which happened because the nobility were angry that the uh, Norman king was not ruling in accordance with uh, English tradition. Mm. Oh, yeah, by well, the way, the Pope did void that document because he wasn't consulted, so just so you know. And uh, to and to Will, uh, don't get myself, Krieger, or my cooler clone wrong. We, we, we accept that these schools exist, and we definitely think that they've had a large influence on this. We just dislike that they do exist. <laughs> Wait, what did, what did you... I'm sorry, I've had a lot of issues with my audio on this end, and I you were breaking up a lot. Oh, I'll restate. I said, don't get uh, myself, Krieger, or Charles wrong. The um, We don't... We don't doubt the existence of these schools. We we accept their existence. We just dislike their existence. <laughs> right. And it's oh, these yeah. schools are just a hive of scum and villainy. Exactly. Well, For real. Wait a minute. Will, I mean, Vic, did you sit down and finally watch Star Wars? If he did, that'd be awesome. So base. If he did, Wait, you? Victor hadn't seen Star Wars up until recently. Yeah, I can neither I mean, confirm yeah. or deny this statement. Okay, okay so well, he did. If you haven't you. seen Star Wars, the original trilogy, then you're not allowed to make quotes. I well, agree. I am. I can neither confirm nor deny that I have seen Star Wars recently. So he did. Which means well, I have. Well, whether or not you confirm nor deny it, it is a good thing that you possibly did and or didn't watch that. I mean, <laughs> the original trilogy is an important part of American film culture. Da, da, da. Oh, wait, we can't do... Oh, wait, of course, Disney the Empire... Does, we can't do more than yeah, five minutes of the film. No, 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 the no, Empire did no, nothing no. wrong. The Empire not only did nothing wrong, the Empire looked good while doing nothing wrong. Exactly. Uh, that being said, I think... Uh, does that bring that topic to a close, then? Yes. I mean, if, I, I mean, if Will has any final things, because... I mean, yeah, I think we actually beat it to death pretty quickly, which was surprising. I thought that we would end up taking more time with that, but... No, hey, if, I can, be... if I can fall asleep before 10.45 p.m., I will be happy. And I haven't had to remove anything yet. Good job, guys. And if you guys, for let's the just rest... drag this out for as long as possible just to make Charles mad. Don't do not yeah. do that. Career. I, I, will, want ice cream. I will find I mean, you in tires. I want ice cream. Uh, I'm gonna make I can start sure defending the Enlightenment. You guys just want. Make Charles mad. That being said, gentlemen, it is question time. If you guys have the document pulled up, which I am sure some of you don't because you don't prepare, we have four me, questions literally tonight. Me. Yeah, we have four questions tonight, and Charles can lead these, Vic can lead these. Uh, but yeah, we do have four questions, and I'm interested to get into them. Okay, well, hold on. Let me make the uh, the time stamp. Okay, question time. Come on, I didn't see that show, so I'm kind of being hypocritical. Okay. <laughs> And where did I put my questions document? Oh, MM questions. There we go. Okay. To be answered this week are the ones with the on the uh, words. The ones with the exclamation <laughs> points. The ones, with, the, ones with, the, the ones with the numbers on them. Okay. That show that it's a list. Why, why aren't... Okay, hold on. Hold on. Okay, so... Actually, I never asked people if if people wanted his if 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 the guys wanted his if each man wanted his name attached to it so we'll just answer the question okay so question the first is it a monarch's duty to represent and advocate for all groups and cultures within within their nation i guess his nation or should he only advocate for his own so I guess we we'll go down the line yeah. for the sake okay. of quarterly. So uh, Brad Raider, then Krieger, then Koshin, then Victor, then me, then Will. It's a good thing that all of our things line up. All right, so no I'll way. start off. So firstly, 
I'd like to say that I think that it's better that a monarch represents specifically his own culture because he can't honestly understand others' cultures, um, being that he isn't a part of them. And nations generally exist to... Um, I'm trying to think of the word. Basically, nations exist to help a culture, to help it grow. And so uh, other cultures within a nation, I think, are outliers, but the main one that should be addressed. So the king of Spain is the king of the Spanish. The king of England is the king of the English. The king of Germany is the king of the Germans, etc. So I think that they should be representing who they're the king of, the Germans, the Spanish, the English, respectively. That's my answer to that one. Krieger. Okay, so like, I think in like the broader sense, like at least somewhat, because like, because like this is all assuming it's like a multi-ethnic country. It's not just a country that's like, I don't know, like, like maybe a handful of immigrants from East Asia, a sprinkle from like, so like in that case, like you sh they shouldn't really have like, Present so that's not like, like that's not like somewhere where it's like crowded ice cream is like where like there's multiple groups that just like have been settled there for like a long time but like and like say like it's like I can't form words but like <laughs> at least yeah. like maybe I don't know like recognize they exist maybe like show up. Like for something, like at least try to understand at least some of the culture. That's my take on it. Cool shit. Okay, so I know nobody likes a pedant, but uh, definitionally, oh. a nation would not have more than one major culture group. Um, I mean, if we're just talking about countries, I get sure. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree that a monarch should. Um, Primarily represent the people he is above. I mean, yeah, if you have a multi ethnic have... country, obviously that's a different question, but um, that would more or less just tie into me having the view that you could generally avoid those types of. Well, rather that um, the nation state is the better model in general. But yeah, you should. The, the the idea that the king of English the king of the English is supposed to represent the English, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's how it should work. Which is why the which is why the multicultural, multi ethnic blobs were never called nations but empires. Yes, correct. And that's why that model yeah. of country is very good. So, in my, to answer the question, okay, to answer the question, to an you're kind of, oh, are you, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm working next to a radio, I'll meet myself, I'll unmute myself for the next question. Okay. Right. So, um, my my answer to this question is the only way a king would. Well, okay. There's a difference. If you are a kingdom, then you are probably going to have only one culture or one group of people. If you're America, you're going to have multiple groups of people. So, I mean, I mean, sure, you should be able to, uh, you should be able to, or be able to articulate what those other people need, but you're never going to understand them as well as your own. Uh, I think that's the way to answer that question. Okay. Um, I would say that, and I'm coming at this from the, okay, guys, you're never going to guess what word I'm going to say next. 
Uh, oh, your your bingo cards. Okay. I'm coming at this from the Carlist. No. Oh, <laughs> the, oh, man. Oh. <laughs> it, come on. Krieger and I would love it so much if you did. For real. For real. I mean, I have a Carlist. But yes. So I am coming so at, okay. I'm coming at this from the. Uh, the legitimate. No. I'm coming at this from the you star. I'm com- Just okay. get to it. Okay, okay. I'm coming at this from, you all know it's coming, the Jacobite tradition. Bingo. Uh, I n- never would have thought. I know. It's, it's, I. We all okay. know what you're going to say. Just don't beat around the bush. <laughs> I will beat around the bush as much as I want. I will get the, I will get the baseball bat and beat the grass around the bush violently until it's just turf. Anyway, Maybe you should get to your uh, Jacobite point there. Okay, okay, okay. My point, my point being that, okay, the king of England was also the king of Scotland and the king of Ireland and also King Francis is also the king of the empire or the water. And in that sense, he's not just king of the English. He's also king of the Scots and king of the Irish and king of the Americans and king of the Canadians and king of the... Australians or whatever. So in that sense, because he is a king of multiple different peoples, he has to know that. And I, I think that for a king of a single broad group like the French, you know, the king, he would only need to know, uh, primarily know the, know the French, and then also have a general grasp of the uh, other groups of people, like the minority of Germans and whatnot, I what would, that are in the country. I would counter that by saying, what kind of French? Ossetonians, Burgundians, Parisians? Oh uh, well, we're just assuming Good that the point. French Republic has done, has uh, merged everyone into a single cultural monolith by this point, even though they shouldn't. But but thanks for reminding me on that. But no, I mean, a king. I think more than just because remember, a culture oh, properly wonder. defined. Huh? How ironic that the French celebrate people in Louisiana learning Parisian French when they stamp out Breton and Occitan and all the other Proto-French languages. Oh, and by the way, Parisian French is not what the people of Louisiana would have been speaking anyway. It would have been Acadian French. Either way. Anyways, my my point... Yeah, no, no. I mean, my point, my point is um, that that a king should understand. So, culture probably defined is the um, underlying values that inform outward manifestations like music and art and whatnot. So, in that sense, you can have uh, pre in pre Reformation Britain, you had the English and Scots who had different outward manifestations, but culturally were very similar because they were both Catholic. Uh, and there were other cultural differences, like with how clan, with the clan system and whatnot. But in that sense, governing England and Scotland together would be easier than governing England and China together. You know, because China isn't a Catholic country. So in that sense, I think that a king can under should be able to, you know, focus on two cultures. But it's not really focusing on two cultures. It's like focusing on one point two five cultures, because at that point you. There Congratulations, are, you know, Charles, you have just insulted every Scottish person that's listening to this. <laughs> well, the Presbyterians <laughs> Scots, and this. to the Catholic Scots, my condolences to the Presbyterian Scots, convert, then we'll talk. Um, no, I mean, I mean, but what I, I mean, and I'm, I'm not dismissing the traditions. I think those traditions are important, and I think that the King, King Francis would do, not Pope Francis, King Francis would do wise. <laughs> to if if he were to seek his claim would be wise to study both english and scottish traditions uh as well as irish and american and whatnot um but that is the uh but the culture the underlying values are similar and in terms of religion they're the exact same in pre-reformation england and scotland so that's so in that sense, the cultures are the cultures are the same in the religious sphere, which is the most important sphere. But then in other aspects, they differ. So the king, if if a king is a king of multiple countries and multiple peoples, I, I really should help me find ways to make my point rapid. If he's a king of multiple 
kingdoms. He needs to know the cultures of those kingdoms, the primary cultures of those kingdoms. And if there are large minorities, he should probably also try to understand those cultures too. Okay, I could have said that. It took me five minutes to say something that I could have summed up in 20 seconds. Punch me, somebody. Okay, Will, no. Will he's closest. Oh, and also I, I, will make, I will make absolutely sure to do that if I ever see you in real life. Okay. <laughs> oh, wait, but you took wrestling, so maybe not you. Um, hey! <laughs> no, you said anyone! L L it's Will's turn. Listen, wrestling. It's not like he did boxing. Yeah, he took wrestling. It that doesn't mean he can necessarily throw a punch. It just means he can throw you. Okay. That's how this thing's a punch, though. Anyways. All right, it's my turn, yes? Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. All right. So I'm going to look at it. Now, to counter a little bit of what Koshing said, yes, a nation typically has one culture, but I think there's a difference between the nation and the idea of the nation state, where if we're looking at a monarch, we're also looking at the administration and the state as an institution. <laughs> not just as a cultural identity, in which case I will have to point at the Austrian Habsburg Empire and state that the Habsburg monarch had to represent a myriad of peoples. And it just, so it depends on the context of the nation and its political climate. If you're in a country like Rome or the Habsburg where you're representing a myriad of people, and was the an empire associated with that nation is more civil identity than necessarily a cultural identity, then yes, you're gonna have to have a monarch that's um what's the word I'm looking for? Reflecting of culture that exists within that nation, whereas if a monarch of a country that is very ethnically homogenous, like say Sweden, Norway, or Russia. Well, I can't say Russia, Russia isn't that homogenous, but you get what I'm saying then you'll start to see that that is not the case. And it just, it really just depends on the context of what kind of leader of what kind of state the monarch is leading. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. Sounds like we've wrapped up that one. Number two. Right. Well, I can read this one out if you want. Sure, why not? <laughs> In what, so, number two. In what manner do you think monarchism can come about in society? I think, honestly, the only way that monarchism is going to become promoted and instituted in a place where it is currently not instituted is through extreme backlash to the current government of whatever state you're st speaking about. And I think that a great example of that currently is the United States government, where they're playing around in the House of Representatives and their inability to elect a House Speaker merely shows how, in my opinion at least, yeah. unusable uh, democracy is. Yeah. And hopefully it would open the eyes of more people to monarchism. It's either that or the way that I did, which was through religion. Krieger. I mean, yeah, I think, like, overall, like, at least right now, the, like, the... Uh, they could be like setting it up as like you know a third position if you will which is totally not biased because i like the third position anyways just like as the alternative to democracy or like whatever the left wanted i don't know i heard it was socialism yesterday now it's communism it might be anarchism sounds like a forecast <laughs> yeah <laughs> socialism is tomorrow and now, the overnight low for tomorrow is communism with a slice of Bolshevism. Mm. <laughs> My favorite kind of weather. Not. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh. Let's see. Did Krieger um, finish what he was saying? Or? I mean, that's about it. Unless you wanted like, another like, three-second ram of incoherent words that I can't form together. Well, that doesn't that hasn't stopped me from forming my random incoherent words. I'll be back in about True. five minutes. Keep the discussion going until I'm back. Okay. So, I guess if Krieger doesn't yeah. want to pull a Charles, then he can pass it on yeah. to Koshin. Yeah. Really have a answer to that as like a general question. So. 
Victor. Yo, um, I think today, if we're talking about today, I think the only way that a monarchy would be able to be established, and this is my personal opinion, this is not the opinion of the organization, I should probably get that out right now, is that the only way is through a collapse of governmental trust that is irrevocable, an irrevocable collapse of trust in government to do even the most basic things like babysit your dog. Um, I think that there would have to be a sort of I hesitate to I hesitate to say this because I know the the jackals will come, but let them come. I think it boosts engagement. I think that the most feasible way for a monarchy to be established today in any country especially ours, is some sort of a Caesar-type figure that vows to save the Republic and yet rules it like a monarch would. And lo and behold, poof, monarch. But that is not the opinion of the organization. The organization wants to have a peaceful transition of power where we convince the populace about the merits of monarchy, which I think this podcast does an excellent job at doing. And I think it's going to take quite a long time for us to get to the point where the people of the United States of America are clamoring for a king. So... That's all I have to say on the subject. Will, go ahead. Actually, um, can I can I ask? Go ahead. Right. Go ahead. Okay. So I was sort of I was sort of thinking about it as you were talking, and I was I will say, in a uh, I guess sort of to add on to what you're saying. I think in a any country that's sort of culturally habituated to being a republic, you would sort of need. I, I don't think success would be possible in any circumstance. If um, the approach taken is not a populist, I think it would have to be a uh, sort of populist approach against a sort of failing bureaucratic elitism or something like that, regardless of anything else. Does that make sense? Oh. Well, well, why are you <laughs> skipping Charles? How dare oh, you? Why skip am I <laughs> oh. you no. How ah. dare you stick the, skip the supreme leader of the podcast? I have the power. The yeah, well, I team. think the supreme leader could probably go laugh. <laughs> yeah, anyway, it's Charles. A supreme, supreme leader will go in order of the rest of his men. Or something. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, we went, in order. we went in a certain order for the first question. Why Why shake it up? It's your turn now. Go or leave it. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, don't let our actual Supreme Leader Joden hear about this. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> he might think I was gunning for his position, which I totally not. I don't want that responsibility. Anyway, mm-hmm. um, Supreme Leader Podcast is enough. Anyways, so, so I think I, that... that what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, monarchism. Oh, the monarchy be established. Okay. okay. <sighs> I'm orchestrating my thoughts. Okay. I think that a Caesarian coup is kind of bleak. I mean, if if it has to be that way, then, I mean, so be it. But um, I, I, do, I do think that it's going to get... I know it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. And we just have to present, continue to present ourselves as the viable, stable alternative, drawing from history to show why we, why this is a good idea. 
stay tuned for an upcoming project uh, coming from Trad Raider and uh, Camellia, who <laughs> you haven't met yet on this podcast, I don't think. Um, but um, yeah, I think that we have to draw constantly from history to show why we are a good thing. And with the rise of Catholicism, you know, traditional Catholicism, then I think that those two things, the, the, with, with the rise of traditional Catholic thought on the religious front and then um, monarchism on the political front working, you know, hand in hand, even if it's just being related, um, I think that that's how we're going to get there. Uh, and I don't, I don't want there to be a civil war because remember Caesar, uh, Caesar saying I'm in charge now, kind of resulted in uh, some stabity stab and some fighties before that whole situation calmed down into the imperial period we're all more familiar with. Uh, and actually, Caesar declaring himself the supreme leader also had a civil war, I think, attached to it, crossing the Rubicon and all that. So yeah, Rome civil wars not good. Uh, Civil Wars are are not... I don't want it to get to that point. Um, Not to interrupt, but to be fair, Julius Caesar, the guy who crossed the Rubicon, is not considered an emperor. Well, I mean, he's a thing in motion, I mean. No, but uh, he was definitely dictator in Perpetua, so... Caesar was definitely going to crown himself anyways. Well, I'm not sure we technically know that. There was a guy who did something similar became a, essentially just a, a complete dictator and then after he felt like what he was dictator for was done he just retired and went off to like farm turnips thing. I, uh, think we're topic. I feel yes. like there's a difference yeah. in character no, Cincinnati, between the Cincinnati two. Cincinnati gave up his power but either way yeah so I guess that's my fun that's fact my, the city of uh, fun fact the city of Cincinnati Ohio was named after Cincinnati <sighs> And yeah, the town of Caesar and in, in the town of Caesar in Michigan mocks it every day. No, I'm joking. But actually, there's little, but there's little Caesars, the pizza restaurant, which I think is a Michigan-based franchise. So it's a Michigan-based um, franchise. It is. It, it is. It was founded by the owner of the tr- Detroit Tigers and Detroit Red Wings, the late and great Mr. Mike Gillich. Mike yes. Gillich was. Also, I believe his a nickname of his was Little Caesar, which is how he came up with the name Little Caesar's Pizza. So, yeah. So I, will, um, I will, will, if I might add on one thing again, if, unless sure. you guys. Okay. No, that's fine. So, I, I, the other thing to add on to that, what that I was going to say is along the same thing, the first man we actually consider to have been an emperor. Uh, of Rome, uh, Augustus didn't exactly just take it over in the coup. He just won a civil war that happened. Several factions. Um, I don't. I don't actually think in the modern day, uh, in most modern countries, a monarchy could successfully established via a coup. I just don't think there would be uh, any sort of real support for it any capacity necessary for it to work out if if it was the one that uh, instigated a coup. So, William, you've been skipped over here. It's uh, you have anything to say? Um, I think it would have to require a very large and massive Rejection of our modern political paradigm and understanding of what a good nation is and what an ideal government is, because it would require us to basically start rejecting enlightenment principles, which is going to be hard because we've built the last 200 plus years of political tradition on the enlightenment. But, um, what else am I going to say? Uh, huh. can't probably we're gonna have to defend the now on one of these podcasts, but um, gosh, what was I doing? Okay, it'll come back, but yeah, I think it would require a massive rejection of our normal political ideas, and I think the continued failure of Republican systems around the world will help lead to that. 
Well, but it'll take time. We might not see it in our lifetime, and it'll have to revolve around cultural changes just as well as political ones. Will? Yeah. When you said, uh, what was I going to say in that exasperated tone? Did you say something before that? No, we didn't. No, we didn't. didn't. Okay, good. Okay, we're still we're still doing good. You may be able to get your digital ice cream yet. Yay. I think that brings us to our next question. All right. Yes, it does. Uh, the question of the British pound sterling, or more precisely, the non-decimal British pound sterling. No opinion. Okay, I have I have it. opinions, but who 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 doesn't? Who okay. wait? I'm sorry. You have an question? opinion on this topic, Charles? Shocking. Yeah. What's well, the question? my only opinion about the British pound sterling is that the, the, the system earlier is non -des the earlier non decimal British pound sterling, not the modern one. It was stupidly complicated, okay. and honestly, I'm glad that it got thrown out. They should have burned it sooner. Fractional monetary system. Who came up with an idea of a fractional monetary system in the first place? Yeah, it's like the imperial system except with money. It's stupidly complicated. It doesn't make sense. Okay. Perfect, but, ah, that's that's where you're wrong. but that's where you're wrong, Will. It it's made perfect sense to the people living at the time because they used it a lot. Just because they coped and used it doesn't mean it makes sense. This is coming from your local engineer. Metric system is superior. Cope. Okay, this is also coming from your local engineer. I'm from dividing by with a base 10 system. It's beautiful. Okay, well, my, my opinion is slightly, um, slightly, slightly different. Um, <laughs> um okay my opinion my opinion is slightly different in that i think that the british system being complicated encouraged people to have a basic to incur it, it had people have a bunch of information you know, a, a man had to have information in his head about that. He had to be able to do some basic math that wasn't just 10, 20, 30, 40, you know. So, Why? Uh, because the last thing people need to do at the register is do complex math and hold up the line. Anyways, well, my only opinion is British, which means ew, icky, no, no, no good teeth, cope and see. Okay, well, shoot, uh, I guess that's it then, so, um, yeah, Wait, okay. one more question, so the last question, uh, let's see, three people read the question, uh, who else has the doc open, just, just Vic, okay, well, I guess then I get to, okay. <laughs> Oh, did any of us actually prepare with Supreme Court case 22-3008? No, uh, I don't think no. Um, I don't remember what it was. Uh, motion for the lead to file an addendum error. <laughs> uh, I'd say none of us are prepared, so we can't give we're gonna, informed... Sorry, this is going to be answered next week if we don't forget again. Okay, what's our next okay. topic topic? The next topic is the younger case, the younger custody case out of the state of Texas. Uh, the father, who's Name is escaping me. I'm going to be scrolling up now and finding the tweet. Yes, Jeff Younger. Jeff Younger, the father of James Younger, had been fighting his ex-wife for custody of the young James for several years now. And the couple divorced on the grounds that the mother thinks that 
James allegedly wanted to transition to be a woman. The father denies this. And, uh, and the son allegedly doesn't want to go through with it, but the mother is essentially wanting him to go through with it anyway. I believe the child is 10 now? I don't... Nine, I think. Nine, ten, something. All right, so... Anyway, the uh, Mr. Younger, the father, filed a writ of mandamus to the Texas Supreme Court. It was denied on December 30th, 2022. Because this is a family law case, he cannot appeal this to federal courts. Which means that James's mother, the former Mrs. Younger, now has full custody of James and can do whatever she likes with him, including taking James to California to transition him. I will say, as a preamble, that we do not definitively know if James actually wants to be transitioned or doesn't want to be transitioned or ever want it to be transitioned. We can only assume for his sake or for the sake of our sanities that he had expressed a desire in the past to transition or, or do something of some sort. Now, we do know, I think, that he likes the color pink, which isn't exactly something that you transition over. It just means that you like pink. The NFL wears pink every October for Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and you don't see anybody, and you don't see anybody calling NFL football players women. Yeah, it's just a stupid thing, and I honestly feel bad for this father, and I pray that he's eventually able to get his son back. And honestly, what this mother's doing is just completely despicable. And yeah. I, I, I'm i sorry, I cannot believe that a nine-year-old boy who's not being manipulated by by his mother is is actually, I'm sorry, L looking at, okay, so the, the pictures of, of this guy, of this kid, okay, when he's with his father, he's wearing, you know, normal clothes for a boy to wear. And, and he, he, he just, I, I. I cannot believe that this mother would think that this is a sane and reasonable thing to do to to it would be a sane and reasonable thing to do. I I'm th this this is not and I mean this. This is not something you do. Okay, I I'm I'm against, you know, friends transing people in general but especially someone who who is nine nine years old no. this kid okay for those of you who are of a certain age and that's my age this kid was born before i mean was born after star wars the clone wars was out okay that was 2000 oh, okay okay that's that's not okay, that's that's not the point what? this kid was born after star wars the clone wars came out Okay, but you were saying something different, Charles. Uh, you were mentioning the difference in the photographs of the boy when he's with okay, his okay, father. Yeah, no, no, no. Okay, this, okay, I, okay, I look at the pictures of this kid when he's with yeah. his father, and this guy, he is a normal kid. I'm sorry. I look, okay, I, and look, I don't know everything about the, this, I don't know everything about James, okay? I, I have never met the kid, okay? But I see... And, and this is just from my work experience. I see a lot of kids, and I and I don't think that these kids 
are half of the stuff that I see put on these kids. I don't think the kid actually wants. Uh, actually, he was like, "Hey, can I do that?" I think. I think the. I think the parents did this. Okay, and James, if there is any justice in this, well, I mean, obviously there's justice in this world, but James, I'm sorry, if he actually is a transsexual, then okay, then that's something that needs to be worked out. But if he, but if he's not chemically castrating the kid, is not is not a solution, okay? Because I'm sorry, former Mrs. Young, okay? Do you realize younger, chem- younger or whatever? You do you realize that what you what you're potentially doing to this cop co- co- kid? To this child, do you realize what you're doing? You you are wrecking. You are wrecking his possibility of getting married and well, not getting married necessarily, but of having his own kids one day. You know. So there you go. I hope I hope you're I hope you're happy not having any grandkids. <laughs> but but that's but that's kind of selfish. I'm just who who in who in his right mind would. I don't care what the law says. I don't give a. I don't care what the secular law says. If the secular law says that this is okay, the secular law is wrong. Okay, if the, the secular law is wrong and everything should be done to be done to prevent it, a judge is supposed to uphold truth and justice. We like to say that upholding the law, the secular law, is upholding truth and justice, but in this case, it isn't. If the if, if the secular law actually says that this is light, then the secular law. Is an inhibitor to truth and justice, and in that sense, the secular law should be cast out of the window. Okay, it should be it should be defenestrated, to use a fancy word, and that's that. And anyone who holds a contrary opinion, I, I don't know. I I'm letting myself get worked up over this, and I and I think that part of that is justified because a nine year old boy is a risk of being chemically castrated. And this is something that really ain't a reversible process as far as I'm aware. And even if it was a reversible process, you don't put someone through this. I'm sorry. This is this is diabolical. And I mean that in the literal sense of the word. This is diabolical. Okay, so yeah. I am finding myself in the position of having an opinion that is more radical than Charles's. Oh but, wow! Um, oh. As far as I am concerned, it doesn't even matter if the kid actually wants this. Oh, I agree. He is a kid. Yeah. Okay, so I, I agree fully. Uh, that's why I said this is an issue for the, the if, if he if he actually does Sorry, want I need, this, this one is second. an issue for the psychologist. Yeah, I, I yeah. started. Saying- um, Gosh, what were you what, what were you saying? Like we were sort no. of I'm about you were done. At this point, there's going to be these, and then I'm going to push me onto the short stuff, which I'm going to be able to get to way faster than this stuff. Uh, okay, I'll probably skip my line. Okay. Uh, um. Okay. Sorry, I'm back. Did I miss anything? Gosh, we were still talking about uh, the James Younger case. Okay. Uh, if I could go back to what I was saying, uh, unless I'm interrupting. You weren't interrupting. Okay. Um, but, yeah, so, uh, like I was saying, he is a kid. Um, Kids don't know, age in general, kids don't know what's good for them. We, we had a movie called uh, Pinocchio that showed the effect of uh, kids going off and doing whatever they wanted. And the result was that um, they turned into jackasses, literally. Uh, but more yeah. than that, this is a subject regarding uh, things that are simply outside of the scope of what a child has understanding of. Like a child does not understand the ramifications of becoming sterile from chemical castration or taking um, large amounts of sex hormone because he's a child. There is literally no possible way for there to be informed consent. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm just going to jump yeah. in. Yeah, I'm gonna jump in real quick. 
quick go back to said like even if this was like reverse it was like you could like kind of get, like get your like, body functions back and stuff as a dude as you're like detransitioning like you gotta understand that this is a kid right he's not even like maybe he's just starting or he hasn't even started it yet but like no he wouldn't have I don't know. nine years old hmm. I can start that early, at least from what I know. Anyways, so like the implication, because like he's nine, he doesn't understand everything. Like the world is just like still like a very cool where nothing can go wrong. But then you're like going to the doctors and like 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 the trauma that comes from like, you know, like these life altering surgeries. Like it's not gonna go away even. If if you just like press undo, and then you like pretend everything goes back to normal. No, there, like, because like it's likely, for, like least the kid is being forced to do this by the mom. Because like maybe the kid said like, I don't know, like maybe likes pink, and then like the mom was like, okay, so he must be trans, and like the dad is evil, and like keep, and it totally can't be because he enjoys the color pink. Like, like the manliest of men do. But of like, course. Maybe he's actually trans, and it's just like starting to express. I said, like, okay, that's cool. This is something that like you shouldn't be able to do this to a kid. Again, the kid just doesn't understand the implications of like what this will mean for the future. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I. I actually have to object to your framing of that. I, I, I because I, I can't really, like, I, I'm actually understanding from the kid on what it means. I, I sort of object to the concept that you would be trans in the first place. Can you kind of cut out there a little bit, buddy? Sorry. Um, sorry, I had the microphone towards the wrong side of my face. Um, basically, because um, because a kid cannot Thank fully understand what it would mean, I, I would object to the phrasing, to, I would object to framing the situation uh, that the kid would possibly trans at all. I, I would argue that it's impossible because the kid cannot understand the concept in the first place. I'd agree with that, mm -hmm. and bouncing off of that point, I'd oh. like to make the arg- So, even if you argue that a mentally stable, fully grown adult should be allowed to make this kind of decision, which I'll get into here in a moment, even if you do agree with that idea, that thesis, there is still the underlying issue of that this is a child. We have made it illegal in the United States to- to have a child of that age consume a chemical that temporarily impairs the judgment. Hey, um, and Fred, that being, I'm so sorry. What's up, Humbo? I did cut some uh, Um, After you speak, can I have my, can I put in my opinion? Of course. Thank but you. like I was saying, we have banned alcohol from being used by kids because it temporarily impairs judgment and long-term affects the brain of developing children. So how in the hell are we allowing chemicals that will permanently alter the physiology and mind of a child like this? How is this legal? And even on moving past that, we've made it illegal for any substance which will permanently affect you, even if it can be recovered from, like methamphetamine or cocaine. Those are illegal. So why the hell are we still permitting this, this hormone treatment therapy, to be legal? This is inhumane. Uh, this so is garbage. Be... This... My I'm point... not sure I would... No, I, I, I get yeah. My it's point sure being, this is inhumane. Well, yeah, this is inhumane. This is degrading, and it will destroy this young boy's life if he's not saved from it quickly enough. All right. My opinion on the younger case is I think the the parent should have, at least have visitation, in my opinion. I don't think he should be exclude, barred entirely from the child. However, transgen this this idea that transgenderism is something you convert to is not uh, it's wrong 
because <laughs> gender dysphoria actually exists. Well, we're where is we're where is a actual mental disorder? We're we're just saying that, but but what? But it's it's that, and I'm not saying this to be cruel. Also, just... also, also, I th but I I think that the child cannot make much. The, the child, there's a reason we have pedophilia laws. It's because the child can't decide for himself properly because his mind hasn't completely developed yet. So I think they should hold on to until they're 18 to fully um to, to um have surgery. If you will, I don't think. I mean, we... it... I I am sitting here, okay, and I I am looking at what has become of this of my country, okay, and and I know I'm getting a little soapboxy here, but. I'm sorry, okay. My church, country, the church, hold on, we're all hold on. Americans up here, are we not? Well, yeah, yeah, yes. I, I, know, I know, but but of our country. Sayos, mm -hmm. Nerashim, okay. Of, okay, and, and, um, and I'm going to follow the church, and, 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 and Humbo, I, I just want you to listen for me for one moment. I am going to follow what the Catholic Church says on this issue. So I would always be against adult transitioning, but even if, even if, Adults transitioning wasn't harmful. If it leads to this garbage, which I think in part it has, then it needs to be thrown out the window. And, I, and I've used that analogy a lot. It needs to be burned at the pillar. This, this whole this whole notion okay, so. of allowing people hold on of allowing people to mutil of allowing a man to mutilate himself and allowing a woman to mutilate himself. And and you know what? And 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 I and I because I don't think that the answer to any mental problem is physically removing a part of your body. Unless that part, unless that part of your body is like legitimately cancerous and detrimental to your health physically, I don't think that there is any justification for mutilating yourself. And I and and, and if that is an opinion that gets me or that will get me arrested in ten years, so be it. I don't care. Shoot me. I don't, I don't care. We don't treat we don't treat schizophrenics by telling them that there are indeed spiders <laughs> under their skin. Exactly. So why do we treat people right. with gender dysphoria differently? I, in First of my all, opinion. If it, it's their and, decision to, it's their. I'm so sorry. It's their no, decision on how to handle gender, gender dysphoria. It's their decision. If they want to. If they want to transform entirely, that's their prerogative. However, there could be all. I mean, gender dysphoria is a complicated subject. I think that it's it should be based upon the person deciding how they how they how they treat this gender dysphoria. It's either transform entirely or through other means. I mean, preventing them to transform entirely is wrong. No, it, it is not wrong. So, okay, okay, there, so there is a... There the, is, issue, uh, the issue there, I have with that is um, it, it is a cosmetic change. It doesn't actually change anything about... It doesn't actually change your biological sex. You, you don't actually become... Well, it makes you feel better. No, it doesn't. Uh, There's a lot of clinical evidence that it does not do that. The including a 50% suicide rate. rate. Um, and there's a suicide. pretty significant, there's a lot of detransition stories out there. Um, oh, yeah, there, there, is, there is that subreddit. There is that subreddit on, like, now, they, when they transitions and they quit. This is also um, setting aside the fact that there, if I recall correctly, some research suggesting that a rather significant portion of people who undergo this type of surgery um, are essentially doing it not because they have we might classify as uh, dysphoria, they have uh, autogynophilia. What's autogynophilia? They, they enjoy the idea of themselves as a woman. And by enjoy, I mean that in a uh, not family friendly way. Put it mm. in, in a way that girls won't get annoyed at. Mm. Well, I mean, if you're talking um, about it in a they are, they are, medical context, it's fine. So I'm not people, people who basically they're doing it not because they have a disorder, but 
treating, but because they get off on they get off on it. And, and to be fair, I God, like I don't think that the law should bar those people from doing it because I don't think the government has a place doing that kind of thing. I think that should be a thing that's handled on on the level of like culture and society. But when it comes to doing this kind of thing with kids, I think um, a in part it's done essentially for brownie. Points. I mean, they're being like, oh, look how progressive my family is. I think, I mean, it's, I done in part, I think it's done in part um, to sort of um, validate other people's choices to, do, to undergo this kind of surgery. And I think um, at some point in the future, we are going to look back on kind of society and view it very similarly to the way we view lobotomies. I, I, I don't know. I maybe my uh, emotional response. Okay, because because I'm not I'm not on the floor with with the kids where I work, but I but when I'm fixing things, you know, I see you know kids playing with the interactives, and I see a whole lot of normal, healthy kids. Okay. Yes. And I, mean, I don't and want kids no, hold, to hold on. I agree with you with that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I. And I. And and I. And you know, people will say, "Oh, he's getting religious or whatever." But I'm sorry. I'm going to acknowledge. I'm going to acknowledge the fact that this world isn't just matter for a moment. And I hold. I'm going to. I'm going to acknowledge sorry, I don't, go ahead. that. I'm going to acknowledge that this world is not just matter. And I'm going to acknowledge that there are devils out there, and that these devils are 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 looking for ways to damn people. Okay, to get or people to get people to damn themselves because because at the end of the day it's an individual's choice whether or not he rots in hell or not. Um, and go. and 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 the fact that there are people who are who are implicitly you know not necessarily you know actively but but who are who are who are cooperating with that is absolutely disgusting and that is why if people say oh but we we need we we can't have we have to have separation of church and state i'm sorry if this is what separation of church and state leads to i don't care we need the church and state back together if okay, that's and, and, I, and I know and I, I know there are people there support. Support. no no there doesn't go our support no 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 Hold this on. is this is this is this is where i will have to draw a line because i have said this before and i will say it again okay i I am first and foremost a Catholic. Before I am anything else, I am first and foremost a Catholic. Why am I a monarchist? Because I'm a Catholic. Okay. And and if and if we are and if we are are saying that as I drop my pencil, if we are saying that we had to compromise with with secularism, if this is what secularism leads to, then I want no part of that. Because because okay, this has to be crushed underfoot and and the way to do that because because it is evil and we need the institution the institution who has who has who ha, who who dogmatically tells us things about faith and morals uh, no hold on i don't i don't okay i think 95 percent uh, of protestants will agree with me I, uh, I think that most protestants if they rationally thought about this would rather have a catholic confessional state than they would have have this nonsense i'm sorry i i would uh, like to think that i have actually made Fairly decent uh, job setting out a sure. secular argument against what we're all railing here. But beyond that, I actually don't think um, there really would be room for people to complain about you bringing religion into it when the concept itself is ultimately um, sort of impl implicitly involves, it gets into that realm anyway, because it, it essentially rest on an assumption of a div uh, division um, a, a material world and an immaterial world because it, it involves the concept of being born into the wrong body as if that's something that could be possible in a purely material world. Like, no. obviously, obviously there is that, that obviously when you're talking about that concept, you immediately are in the realm where um, religion is a relevant thing to bring up. 
But even beyond that, I'd like to think that I've actually made a fairly decent secular argument. Against it, so. Well, I think you have, but I, I think that I think that in this, okay, because religion is the ultimate end in of itself. But in this particular context, I I am going to I'm going to use every piece of artillery at my disposal, okay. And 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 I'm I I just I don't okay. And I'm not saying religion is just a a tool, okay, because religion, oh, religion is telling us something here that is true, okay. Religion and and I am and if and if religion is saying something, I'm going to say, hey, religion is saying something. And I know we can make the secular argument, and the secular argument may be more convincing for some people. Because there are some people who don't believe in, in God. And okay, I get that. But I'm still going to throw out the religious argument. Because at the end of the day, I think that that's what should be... I'm going to take a deep breath. Because this has gotten me worked up. I feel like I've had caffeine. I mean, I have today. But like, I feel like I've recently... That I'm, that I'm getting like the caffeine buzz that I normally get when I had a mocha frappe in the morning. Um, well, I will say that what you have said will probably boost engagement to those of to our audience that actually is listening this far. I, I uh, well, this is all getting cut anyway. So no, but the... okay. My point, my my entire point is, I mean, if you want to, what, however way you want to treat the gender dysphoria, I'd recommend you do it because. You know, it's upon the person to decide that, not the state. No, well, but I, I think the, 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 the sort of libertarianism. Hold on, hold on. The Multiple sort of, people talking at once. Let Charles talk. Okay, thank I'm you. Sorry. I'm sorry. The the sort of libertarianism on this issue is not something that I can handle because sometimes a person does not know what is best for him, and I'm not saying that. As someone who is advocating for glorious socialism, comrade. Okay, sometimes oh people are not right in the head. Sometimes people need to be sent to a sanatorium. Sometimes people are okay, and I'm not saying that all all people who suffer from 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 gender dysphoria, gender identity disorder, whatever we want, whatever we're whatever we're whatever we're gonna call it today. Um. <clears throat> okay whatever Probably. we're gonna call it today. hold on whatever we're gonna call it today okay, okay i'll get to my point because people pinging me distracts me i'm sorry it's not it's not your fault okay whatever we're gonna call it today i'm not saying the people who suffer from that should be locked in an asylum but what i am saying is that is that any individual does not necessarily know what is best for him most adults are capable uh, most adults are capable of um, um, any average adult is capable of making his own decision but when it comes to something that is permanently damaging, then there is room for intervention. And this is not a dangerous precedent to establish if we use the crowns of, of proper moral understanding. Okay, this is not establishing a dangerous precedent where the state can say, uh, you wear the color, you wore blue on last Tuesday, therefore you must be insane, because there's no moral reason for not wearing blue on Tuesday. Okay, th there, th this, is, this is where religion firmly grounded in society and in the state has um, or, or religion being a, a principle of the state is is the advantage because the state will not be able to go farther than it should, and it will have to go as far as it should. Okay, that is that is another another element here, and I do not think that an individual who thinks he is a, a member of the opposite sex is truly in the right frame of mind. And I say this, and if you and if you are, I. I, I'm saying this from the bottom of my heart. I love you in the sense the Catholic Church says love. To will the good of the other. I truly want what is best for you. I want you to be... to find fulfillment in life. Okay? I'm going to be honest. I think you're talking to a brick wall. I am talking... I probably am. I'm sorry. When I'm worked up, I, I get this way. No, and I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think anybody who would be on that level is going to care that you're saying, well, no, I, I also want what's best for you. We can agree on that. I, I really don't think they're going to care. I, the, to be you fair, know, maybe I just don't have a view of you. On, yeah, on that, that demographic you probably won't care because that demographic has been lied to their entire lives. And, um, 
and that's that's the thing. I, I, I yeah. Um, I don't know. Does anyone else have anything, anything nope. of value to contribute to this? No, I do actually. Yeah. I do actually, if you will allow me. Okay. I know that other people have wanted to, I guess, um, sort of, yeah. uh, interrupt you, but I wanted to sort of, I wanted to sort of say that. <laughs> Okay, I'm getting a lot of interference here, so whoever's Your doing that can oh, mute yourself. Me again. Uh, let me mute myself. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Everyone, that just was, mute yourself if you're not. Talking. That was that was that was very that was very distracting. Um, let me get back to let me get let me just uh, take a let me take a second to get my thought back. Uh, da, 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 da. Right. Um. So. Uh, I think that what Charles is saying is that, yes, secular arguments can be used to try to convince someone, but at the end of the day, he is not going to, he's, Charles is going to leave everything out there on the field. And he's not going to hold anything back from his quiver, even if he thinks it'll do no good in your particular case, because someone else might be hearing it of another disposition and think, oh, this religion, this religion stuff, that sounds very good. I might want to look at this. So here's, so here's. Sorry, go ahead. So, so, so I think what he is, I think there is merit to discussing thing, to discussing these, having these sorts of discussions within a religious framework, but we also have to keep in mind that not everyone is going to be convinced by a religious framework. I I wish that a lot of people were, but that is not the reality of the world in which we live. We need to use secular arguments to convince some to go along with what we want to do. So I, I do want to clarify that I don't actually think making uh, arguments and political decisions based on um, morality that's by religion is a violation of the separation of church and state. I think that's like a uh, like a uh, smooth brain understanding concept to be uh, a little to be a little better there. But um, like no, that's just a normal. That's not really what I would. Use. Like, absolutely, okay, yeah. okay, maybe I might have misinterpreted what you were saying, so please. No, just, he was saying, oh, you know, that this is what secularism leads to. I, I, I was just trying to say, I, I think, um, the secularism being a thing because it's automatic. I was, I was you were trying to turn the concept of secular history. It's just, it doesn't, in, 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 Necessarily leads to that. Make secular arguments. Sense. That's all I was trying to say. Okay. Um, does anyone else have have anything before we before we move on? Because um, I'm, uh, because but there's something one last thing that I do have to do. Does anyone have any? No. No. Okay. Sir. Um. All right. So what I'm gonna say here. Uh, if you have made it to this point, uh, one of two things have happened. I have either cut the conversation from the point that Humbo has has joined in, but or I have kept it. Uh, but either way, okay, us complaining about this about the situation isn't isn't going to do as much good 
I was praying about it. And we're also going to pray for him, James, this James fellow, at the end of the podcast, too. But right now, I'm just going to take a moment to 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 pray. Let's like get my little crucifix at the memorial prayer. And, and, and... Hey, hey, Charles, I wanted to say if I made you mad during this podcast, I apologize. Uh, and I, I was trying to make it in good debate. I was yeah, sorry if well, you got mad. It's not, it's not so much anger at you, but anyways, I just, I just, okay. Um, okay. Charles is gonna have so, to take so I'm gonna, to oh, hold on. Okay. So I'm just, I what, I was, what I was trying to say is, is that this, is that, all of what we said is not going to do this kid because I think we can all agree that this kid right now, at the very least, should not be getting injected with hormones. I, th- uh, I mean, I yeah. agree. They shouldn't make any major decisions until they're 18. Yeah. You had me until the 18 there. Anyways, no, but no, no, no. Okay, I'll, I, but what I'm saying right now is, is that right now we need to pray for this kid because that is going to do more good. So right now, the prayer of Saint Bernard to our Blessed Lady uh, for the intention of this of this boy's health, and we're also going to say this at the end of the podcast too. So, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee. O virgin of virgins, my mother, to thee do we come, before thee we kneel, sinful and sorrowful. O mother of the word incarnate, despise not our petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer them. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So, with that, I know I normally like to say, does anyone else have any final things? But on this topic, but I'm pretty sure I can infer that we're ready to move on because yes we are ready to move yeah. on and in right. eight minutes in eight minutes as of the time of our recording it is 9 52 p.m eastern on the feast of the epiphany january 6 2023 we will have the 14th ballot or at least i presume we will have the 14th ballot to determine the speaker of the house the fact that it has taken 14 ballots and counting, maybe, to determine the Speaker of the House is asinine and idiotic. And Kevin McCarthy, uh, Prussian Dixie, would you like to get up on the soapbox, please? Friedrich? Well, I, I ain't really got much to say about, um, <clears throat> about him, honestly. I find, I'm going to be honest, I find this more of just something just laugh at and just watch as it all unfolds. That's all I really see from this. Give it uh, up for vote 14. Give it up for... Here's to... Vote 14! 130 more. Let's beat the record, guys. Oh, do we want to um, take wagers on how many ballots it's going to reach or no? no. Listen, man, I'm betting that they're going to, like, try to, like, beat the record. It's, we only need 129 to tell. This time. I, I, I think, think that... Okay. Getting it so this here's time. my question. What happens if they can't pick a speaker and make a budget in time? So does the Senate budget get passed by default, or does it cause a constitutional crisis if the Senate tries to force a passing because the... Con- because, um... What's the word I'm looking for? Because the House of Representatives couldn't pass or consent to the budget. In which case, do we go into a government shutdown until they can pick a speaker? Or what happens? I believe so. Yes. But if you do not have a speaker of the House, you cannot have a House of Representatives, which means you cannot pass anything at all. I... I, I think that this is a perfect opportunity for that. Well, no, I'm not even going to joke about that. But no, I I think that this just kind of 
proves how stupid this this whole elected. You see, it'd be so much. Wouldn't it be so much easier if we had some sort of ultimate head of the secular part of government who could pick the leader of no. the representative of the plebs? Wouldn't that be? Wouldn't that be so great? I am very, very concerned about my family because my mother works for a non for profit that's funded by the state. So if a um government shutdown happens, she doesn't get paid. No, my and, business already got the federal pork bar barrel legislation, so we're good. Well, I mean, her her place of business does not open if there is no if there's a government shutdown, so she won't get paid. Oh, that's that's not good. Yeah. So I'm very much worried about my family if there's a government shutdown because they don't make ends meet if there's a government shutdown. And I think a lot of, and you know, we're laughing at this, and I mean, I'm laughing at it too, but after a while I think it's going to stop being funny and start being concerning right, right. because it's going to affect people personally at that point. Well, I am going to inform you that members of the 118th House of Representatives are filing into the House floor. As we speak, are we going to cover it through the entire vote, or are we going to wrap up beforehand and then announce? I on think we should. We should, we should, we should wrap it up. Uh -huh. here. I don't we think we can do a whole. Long. We're we're already an hour past our regular. Oh wait, wait. There's there is there is one new question, and should there be a basic? Budget law where the bare minimum get paid every year for cases like this. I'm going to keep this as part. So of a universal, ba so a, so a temporary universal basic income. I don't agree. I agree with this. Well, I think it. I think he's. I think Bubba here specifically referring for people who are on the federal dime when it comes to when it comes to employment. Then I'd agree because if the government can't, do it, then they need to still be paying the people who work for them. Yeah, yeah let, let's not take it yeah. out of the I Yes, that's not paying the people. Remember, in every other system we see in the West, in Britain, in France, in well, I'm not sure about France and Germany, but I know in Britain, if a government cannot make a budget, government employees aren't put out of work. It's the parliament that gets put out of work, and then they immediately hold an emergency election to basically find someone who will pass a budget. But no, in the U.S., Congress is allowed to sit and twiddle their thumbs while American citizens go without pay and without employment. Hardworking American citizens who work the, for uh, members, oh, By the way, the members elect of the House of Representatives don't get paid either. Yes, they I are still Wait, <laughs> wait you're telling me the Electoral that. College doesn't get paid? But you know what I'm saying. The point is... Yep. The wrong people are being put out of work because they can't do their jobs. Well, let's let's compromise between the European method and the American method. We don't hold an election, but the current Congress is still fired. I, I at this point, I just want like the speaker to not be. Uh, no, never mind. You go. I, don't, I I don't know. I I all I know is is is, is that this is just. Give it up for vote 14, no people. All I know. Know. Give it up for oh, vote 14. Okay. Whoever wants to post that meme. We already okay. did, I think. Oh, of course we did. Fear of the Krabby yeah. Patty is a good SpongeBob episode. I'm not going to lie. Uh, all right. SpongeBob. Okay. Okay, there we go. We can all we agree that SpongeBob, that SpongeBob was a great show that has declined in quality and Nickelodeon yeah. should just let die already. Okay. Yes. Well, yeah. We all agree on something. Let's wrap this up. Anyways. Okay, we're all good. No, I got my final two thoughts on uh, Goofy uh, House. Goofy House. The dog. first one, I nominate Caligula's horse as Speaker of the House. Yeah. Because he has proven to be a very capable politician in the past. I don't see why we can't bring him back. And second of all, here's to 130 more ballots because we need to beat our record because America's got to be on top. Alrighty. Right. Let's so uh, let's let's take her home so we can get to the regular DC and you know. Do yeah. That. Um. Okay. So we're gonna. So here's how this is gonna work. Uh, I'm gonna do the normal outro spiel. Then before prayer, the Epiphany Declaration will be read by Vic. Read. Uh, and then 
Um, then, then we're going to say the memorial again, and then we're going to say the Our Father as normal. So, so it's going to be a it's going to be a Charles Vic Charles thing. I like to uh, when you refer to yourself in the third person, you know that that's how you know you're saying. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I can do the Our Father if you want me to. Oh well, I mean, well, I I I would. It's just that rule dictates that 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 if Aiden and uh, John aren't Didn't here, then them? I have to do it. Ah, bien. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I wrote the rules, but I'm not going to break them. Well, I, I do all the time. <laughs> Whatever. Anyways, so, outro. I, it's, a, it's a two hours exactly. Great. Okay. If you would like to join us live for Monarchist Minute, so you can see um, uninterrupted my stream of consciousness, uh, you can do that by joining, by following us in the description box below by clicking that discord link it's right there it's been waiting for you it's specifically been waiting for you it's there for you imagine i'm pointing directly at you if you would like to hear us not by not hearing us and reading us on twitter then you can do that link in the description below if you are a neocon i'm sorry for you i'm sorry but you can also follow us on gab link in the description below. We have a imagine website. Being, <laughs> imagine having a Gab account. We don't post. I have two, technically. I have my Gab account, which I posted on like one, so then I have the MOA Gab account. No, there's the there's the um, MOA USAM account, too. Oh, they are to Charles Vare gaveling. So we might have to wrap it up now. Okay, Again, gambling, gambling. I'm in the mood. I'm in the mood. And, 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 okay, 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 okay. Yeah, okay. Everyone, everyone, everyone who ordered. is not me and my clones, stop it. Okay. So, if, Gap, if, ironically, if, so, if Humbo, 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 you are not my clone. Shut, shut up. <laughs> Humbo, shut up, please. Krieger, shut up, please. Everyone shut up. Let Charles speak. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, clone. Okay. If you would like to, if you are old and would like to follow us on Facebook, you can do that too. Link in the description below. And I'm speaking this from the bottom of my heart. If you would like to go on our Instagram, which is being updated by someone and I don't know who. You can do that by following us and say it with me now, everyone. Link in the, in description, the description below. And now it is time to conclude with prayer. But before that, we must conclude with a reading of the Epiphany Proclamation. But help me how you, by um, Vic. No, dear brethren, that as we have rejoiced at the nativity of our Lord Jesus Christ. So by leave of God's mercy, we announce to you also the joy of his resurrection, who is our Savior. On the 22nd day of February will fall Ash Wednesday and the beginning of the fast of the most sacred Lenten season. On the ninth day of April, you will celebrate with joy Easter Day, the Paschal Feast of our Lord Jesus Christ. On the... On the ninth day of April. On the on the eighteenth on the uh ninth day of April, sorry about Easter. On the eighteenth day of May. You will celebrate the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ on the 28th day of May, the Feast of Pentecost. On the 11th or the 8th day of June, you will celebrate the Feast of Most Holy Body and Blood of Christ. On the 3rd day of December, the first Sunday of Advent of our Lord Jesus Christ, from his honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And for um, the safety of James and of, of all children who are, <laughs> and all people who are unfortunately in this predicament, remember. O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection 
implored thy help, or sought thy intercession, was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O virgin of virgins, my mother, to thee to become, before thee we kneel, sinful and sorrowful. O mother of the word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer them. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Um, until next week, may God bless you, uh, and may God bless the United States of America.